One of the central themes that I've really tried to get across for you guys so far this semester is that I want you to use logic. I want you to understand the basics enough so that when things go screwy or when things become slightly less than perfect, you can start to guess at how they're going to happen, why they're going to happen, what are the causes of them, and how is the body going to respond to them, right? So think about energy systems and think about if something goes awry in the electron transport chain, how are we going to manipulate certain variables? How's our body going to adjust to manipulate certain variables in order to adjust, in order to compensate, right? Just like, just like energy metabolism, exercise and muscular contraction is going to go awry and it's going to have a time where it's not going to function optimally and largely that's going to be fatigue and fatigue is going to be the inability of the muscle to produce the amount of force that it normally would right so it's it's less than able to produce the ideal amount of force or 100 percent force that it would normally be able to do if we think about this logically if we if we put together pieces to the whole let's think about how we might generate fatigue before we even go into the lecture let's let's think about how we can how fatigue might happen if we look at excitation contraction coupling we look at excitation so there's neuromuscular impulses there's there's signal coming from the brain there's a depolarization from the brain that depolarization reaches the neuromuscular junction. There's vesicles that fuse a release of neurotransmitters, a binding at the motor end plane of those neuroreceptors, the neurotransmitters, a depolarization that occurs. That depolarization travels deep into the muscle cell because of the transverse tubules and because of and because of the transverse tubules. Because of the transverse tubules and the conduction of the energy or the conduction of the electricity we're going to have a release of calcium from a sarcoplasmic reticulum. That calcium is going to be released. It's going to bind with troponin. It's going to shift the tropomyosin, reveal the active binding sites for myosin on actin, and we're going to, boom, click that myosin onto the actin, form a cross bridge. We're going to drop off inorganic phosphate and ADP. We're going to have a power stroke. ATP is going to rebind, break that cross bridge. We're going to hydrolyze ATP into ADP plus PI, recock, and then we're ready to go as long as calcium is still present, right? Where can that go awry? What about the neuromuscular side of it? What about the neural side of it? We can have things go wrong with the neural signaling and the neural impulse, right? We can have a slowdown of conduction. That might cause from some fatigue. That might adjust how much or how hard a muscle is going to fire. What about calcium? What about transduction of signal inside of the muscle? What about ATP concentrations? What about the resequestering speed of that calcium? All of those things are things that can start to go wrong inside of a muscle with continuous repeated movements, such as what happens with exercise. So what is exercise-induced muscular fatigue? It, it occurs both at high intensity and submaximal intensity prolonged duration activities. In essence, it is just the inability to generate power that it normally would able to do. It's unable to generate the same amount of force, right? The concept of fatigue is nebulous. The concept of what exactly is fatigue, what is, can we call this fatigue and not that fatigue? The definition is slowly expanding and it's slowly growing and we're slowly nailing it down. But what we do know is that there's several factors that control fatigue. We can have nutrition. If you manipulate your nutrition, what are you going to be manipulating? Your energy systems, your ATP availability, the speed at which you can make ATP. What about your fitness state? If you get more fit, are you able to do all these things more efficiently? Muscle fiber type we'll get to. Intensity and duration as well, right? Like each one of these variables, as they get manipulated, are going to adjust your fatigue levels or the muscular fatigue. You've all seen this in the gym. I know you know what fatigue feels like. Now let's just talk about what it is. There's fatigue is different whether it is short duration, high intensity, or long duration, low intensity. 
The mechanism of fatigue can be similar in some ways, but it's also very different in many ways. For that short duration, high intensity, anaerobic glycolysis, phosphocreatine, it's largely going to be a, a manipulation of calcium and sequestering speeds and release of calcium, as well as hydrogen ions uh, or H plus or acid levels. Free hydrogen ions make the system more acidic, free radicals and increase in organic phosphate. So the, the hydrogen ions, if you have an increase in hydrogen ion concentration, I'm doing this because I'm drawing brackets in my head, and you put brackets around something to show concentration of. free As you, as you increase hydrogens, you decrease the pH. As you manipulate the acidity of an environment, you're going to manipulate the ability of an enzyme to work. If you make something more acidic and an enzyme doesn't work as well, how well is myosin ATPase going to work in order to cause contraction? It's not, it's not going to work well, right? Ghost Mike. Free radicals are essentially unpaired electrons, and you, you need to consider how those get generated with incomplete, um, incomplete fueling pathways, incomplete bioenergetic pathways. Where would that come in? Where are we seeing free electrons? Electron transport chain, exactly. Um, low intensity, long duration, this is going to be more like your, your slow, long distance, your LSD runs, your marathon runs. More than likely, because of the intensity with which you're doing this, it's not likely going to be hydrogen ions or, or acid levels that are going to be contributing fati fatigue. Most likely, it's going to be a fueling-based issue. It's going to be decreasing levels in muscle glycogen concentrations. You see there's those brackets, as well as free radical generation. If you're just burning through that electron transport chain, the odds of getting unpaired electrons in, in superoxide, which is essentially like a charged oxygen molecule, is grows in likelihood. Because the more you pump through that system, the more likely you're going to see um, not so glorious benefits as well. In order to really discuss fatigue, we need to discuss what are the different muscle fiber types and how they might be fatigable or less fatigable or what's their contractile force and not their contractile force because remember fatigue is largely related to force and power. Realistically, there's only two broad categories. I don't know why my mic is being so stupid. I apologize. Realistically, there's only two broad categories of fiber types um, that are found in humans. We're going to have type 1 fibers that are going to be slow twitch. These are, these are oxidative fibers or red fibers. And you're going to have type 2 fibers, which are going to be our fast twitch fibers. Uh, there's 2A and 2X. We'll get into that a little bit more. But in general, slow twitch, oxidative, fast twitch, not as oxidative, more, more high power high force, um, high hydrogen ion concentration. There is muscle groups that are, that are fairly mixed, um, but there's also muscle groups that are predominantly one type of fiber or the other. Our postural muscles are going to be more type 1 fibers because of their action, because of what they tend to do. They need to be less fatigable, whereas certain other types of fibers um, or muscle groups specifically are going to be predominantly type 2 fibers realistically, there's only so much you can do to transition fiber type. You can, you can create these like in between fiber somewhat. It, it's kind of mixed in terms of the science. In the most part, the percentage of fibers that you're going to have within your body and within specific muscle groups is going to be genetically driven. That's why they say sprinters are born, marathoners are made. You cannot, you cannot shift your muscle fiber typing to an extreme. When it comes to properties of muscle fibers, we're going to divide these type 1 and type 2 really on three different biochemical properties. Oxidative capacity, and that's how likely or how well are they able to use oxygen, and that's going to be due to blood flow, so capillarization, how much blood is flowing towards that muscle. If it's a lot, then it might be able to pull out even more oxygen. If there's not a bunch of blood flow going to it, it's not going to require as much oxygen because it's not going to be able to get as much oxygen. The number of mitochondria drive the biochemical property of the oxidative capacity because we need mitochondria in order to go through electron transport chain. 
and then the amount of myoglobin. So myoglobin is hemoglobin inside of the muscle. Similar concept, right? It is an oxygen carrier inside of the muscle. Myo is means it's der derivation for muscle. So myoglobin is an oxygen carrier in muscle. The myosin isoform, so the specific type of myosin, the specific type of that thick muscle or contractile protein, that big contractile protein, the myosin heads have different speeds of ATP activity. If you're able to rapidly cleave ATP, it's going to have a faster contraction because you can you can recock and pull and recock and pull and recock and pull even faster and faster and faster. Think about it like this. How fast can you run a bolt gun versus how fast can you run a semi-automatic gun, right? In a bolt gun, you kind of have to recycle the bolt every single time, whereas in a semi-automatic, you can just pull the trigger. Very similar in terms of ATPase activity. The faster the ATPase activity, it's like pulling that trigger fast. Whereas the slower it is, it's more likely that it's going to be a slow, determined, and dedicated process. Also, the abundance of contractile proteins. So the larger the muscle fiber, the more likely it is to have more contractile proteins. The more contractile proteins, the more force we're able to generate because we can have more cross bridges, more contraction, more pulling over, more Z-disc shortening, right? Something here that I want to point out is that when it comes to hypertrophy, when it comes to muscle growth, we don't usually end sarcomeres or increase sarcomeres in series. So we're not adding sarcomeres to the end of muscle and lengthening muscle. We actually add them in parallel. So we tend to add, and that's why the myonuclear domain is so important, is we tend to add contractile proteins in parallel. So we actually increase the depth of the muscle fiber, not the length of the muscle fiber. The other major um, division is going to be the contractile properties, right? How much force does a contraction produce? How fast does that contraction occur? What's the power output of that contraction? And then how efficient is that contraction? So for force, it's how, how much specific tension can that muscle create? How much, how much can that move per contraction? Speed of contraction is how fast can we shorten? What's the maximal velocity of shortening or Vmax? How fast can we cross bridge cycle? <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing this. Maximal power output? Well, that's just a combination of force and shortening velocity. So it makes sense that that would be a contractile property, right? Power equals force times shortening velocity. And then the efficiency. So that's how much energy does it take to get a specific amount of work out? If it doesn't take a bunch of energy and you get a ton of work out of it, it's more efficient. If it takes a ton of energy and not a whole bunch of, it doesn't produce a bunch of work, then it's not the most efficient fiber. For most of you guys, this is going to be common sense, but I want you to think that type 1s are going to be highly capillary dense. They're going to have large numbers of mitochondria, so they're going to go and have, uh, they're going to actually have a concept of my, mitochondrial biogenesis at a higher rate, so they're actually going to generate more mitochondria faster. Their velocity of shortening is significantly slower. They have a lower specific force, but they're efficient. So they can continue to work well just with low amounts of force. And on this right-hand side, because of the capillary density, those type 1 fibers are going to be red, uh, and the type 2s are going to be the white fibers. Type 2x, take and go from a 1 and flip it upside down, right? Small number of mitochondria, limited aerobic capacity, that's going to be our white folks here. This is going to be our this is going to be our white fibers here. They're, they're not going to be highly aerobically um, capable. They're going to be more anaerobic. They're going to be rich in those glycolytic enzymes because we want to turn over energy fast. The specific force or specific tension of a type 2 fiber is going to be fairly similar between 2X and 2A, which is the other type of 2 fiber that we see often in humans. It's going to have the highest velocity of shortening, so it's going to contract fast, and it's also going to give us the most power output. And it's not very efficient with all that. So we're going to have to burn through some stuff to get there. Type 2A fibers, basically Goldilocks, a type 2X, and a type 1 fiber. They're going to be somewhere in between, right? It's, it's 
literally that simple. They're going to be somewhere in between. It's think mid distance running. What about performance? Can we use muscle fibers to predict performance? If we know that there's differences in force, we know that there's differences in fatigability, we know that there's differences in velocity, we could guess that there might be some fiber type difference in force um, or fiber type difference in performance. Really, when it comes to men versus female, there's not a huge difference when it comes to muscle fibers specifically. And, and fiber ratios. Men and women tend to have a very similar uh, composition. Sedentary individuals are going to be about 50% slow fibers. As you transition into a training status, you're actually going to gain certain changes in fiber status, if you will. You're going to actually transition and have more intermediate fibers and stuff like that. The greatest proportion of muscle fibers that are type 2x are going to be found in your highly gifted sprint power athletes. Whereas for the individuals that are highly skilled in endurance events, they're going to have a greater predominance of type one fibers. But what I want you to know is that final sentence is super cool, right? Fiber type can only predict up to 40% of the variance in VO2 max. What that means is that for an individual's VO2 max, you can only ascribe 40% of that number to their, their muscle fiber type. So you could change fiber type and still be 60%. Um, like there's still 60% influence coming from other things. And that's, that's mental, that's nutrition. There's a bunch of things that go into that, right? In order for muscle to produce force, there has to be muscle actions occurring, right? Muscle force has to have an action occurring because it cannot change shape or it cannot exert force without exerting an action. So a, a isometric contraction is going to be when there is no change in joint angle. So here, you have an individual holding a dumbbell at one static spot, and there's still a contraction going on. He's still fighting that weight, but there's no net movement. So the load, the mass of that object that he's trying to move is equal to the amount of force that he's able to put out. Here on a concentric contraction, you can see that there's a net movement. There's a net sh displacement of that dumbbell. So you actually have a shortening of the muscle fibers. You can see that you actually have contraction occurring or concentric contraction occurring. That movement occurs. So there's a change in the joint angle and that muscle is shortened and force was created. He was able to overcome the resistance with force. Here on the eccentric, as he's controlling it on the way down, He's allowing the force of the dumbbell to exert a slightly greater, um, he's allowing the mass of the dumbbell to create a slightly greater force on that muscle and allow it to lengthen. So an eccentric muscle lengthening or increasing the joint angle, concentric muscle shortening. Up to this point, we've talked about how a muscle receives a signal, how a muscle contracts why a muscle contracts and kind of the, the chemical and biochemical and functional differences between the different types of muscles, skeletal muscles that we have. Now let's talk about kind of the speed at which that muscle contracts or, or the rate at which that system occurs, the, the integration of excitation and contraction coupling. Let's talk about that speed. Well, a twitch is going to be a single neural impulse, right? So think about how your eye will twitch, right? Like it might be a single neural impulse that's divided into three different distinct periods or a single depolarization that is divided into three different periods. There's going to be a latent period, so it's going to receive the signal, interpret the signal. There's going to be contraction phase, so that signal is going to actually cause a movement, and there's going to be a relaxation phase. So there's three different periods on this. The timing of that phase in each one of those phases is going to be muscle fiber type dependent. So fast fibers are going to be different than slow fibers in each one of these aspects. Regardless of the fiber type, it's always going to have an all or none principle. So that means that if there is a neural input coming in and it reaches a threshold value, every single Mu muscle cell that that motor neuron is innervating is going to fire it is all or none everything that that motor unit innervates is going to fire once a depolarization threshold happens
So how do we regulate the amount of force? If we know that every single muscle fiber is going to happen as soon as we get this depolarization, how are we going to regulate the force? Well, our body's going to start by recruiting the minimal amount of motor units that it needs. So imagine picking up a pencil, right? So imagine that you have to go reach and pick up a pencil. Is it worth your body sending a maximal signal to every single muscle in your body to say, this thing weighs a million pounds, you need to pick that up? No, because you would take and throw it through the roof. On the flip side, let's say you know you need to lift something that's several hundred pounds. How are you going to get there? We well, have to advance through every single step in order to get there. The efficiency of the movement is still needs to be maintained because if you exert more force than is needed, you might injure yourself. If you don't exert enough force, you're going to injure yourself. So your body's going to actually kind of like step up the intensity with which it's contracting different muscle fibers and muscle fiber types in order to reach the desired outcome. So the amount of force in a muscle is going to be dependent on these kind of four things. Number and type of motor unit recruitment. So we're going to be recruiting more or less motor units. Just talked about that. You're going to decide on the optimal length or the length of the muscle. If there is no overlap of actin and myosin, do you think there's going to be a contraction? No, right? Like if we don't have the ability to create an, a myosin cross bridge, then we're not going to have a net shortening because there's nothing for that sucker to grab onto. It'd be like trying to slap Velcro on a, on a wall or something. The nature of the neural stimulation is also going to play a factor. If it's just a single twitch, then it's just one baby, baby impulse and that's it. Any additional impulse into that will create a summation. As soon as you start continuing that you're going to get a tetanus and then a sustained contraction and that's coming on future slides i promise and then the last thing that's going to kind of regulate force generation is going to be the contractile history of that muscle fiber so let's say that you are fresh and you go to draw a 70 pound bow is it going to be easy or hard because you have not done anything and you're completely cold well, it's going to be a little bit hard because you're not used to the force, but it's going to be easier than if you had drawn it a hundred times that day, right? Because you're trying to pull back 70 pounds, your muscle is going to get fatigued, but you can actually increase or warm up the ability of that muscle to exert force by going through something called post-activation potentiation. And that's essentially sub-maximal effort contractions, trying to increase the affinity uh, for calcium release. If our muscles are exerting force and they're going through a concentric muscle action or an eccentric muscle action, there's going to be a net velocity because there's going to be a speed at which the displacement or the movement is occurring, right? So the force velocity curve or the force velocity relationship is essentially that at any absolute force exerted by the muscle, the velocity or speed of the movement is greater in muscles that contain higher percentages of fast muscle fibers. That makes sense because the Vmax is going to be higher. We already went over that. You know that. Now that second bullet point under force velocity, think about it. The maximum velocity or muscle shortening is greatest at the lowest force. Therefore, the greatest speed of movement is generated at the lowest workloads. Think about how fast you can throw a baseball versus how fast you could throw a bowling ball. Same concept here. You're going to actually be able to exert the greatest amount of speed with the lowest amount of resistance or the lowest workload, if you will. Now, the power velocity gets even more interesting because at any given velocity of movement, peak power generated is greater in muscle that contains a high percentage of fast fibers. No crap, right? We understand that basically copy and paste from the from the previous one because it has a speed component, it has a force component. We know that we're gonna have to we're gonna be regulated by muscle fiber typing some way. Now that second bullet point again gets interesting. Peak power generated by any muscles increases with increasing velocity up to a speed of two hundred to three hundred degrees per second. There's then a plateau that occurs at two hundred to three hundred degrees per second. And that is because in order to increase the velocity, you must increase the speed. So you must decrease the force, right? So in order to change, you in order to increase the speed, you have to decrease the force in order to optimize power. 
you can't, if you want to have high force movements, it's not going to occur at a high velocity. And that's what this curve is going to be showing you. So that's why maximal strength, one rep max efforts feel like they can take forever and they're not very fast and they're grinders. And that's because you cannot move a maximal weight fast. You just can't do it. On the other side, you cannot move with maximal force an object that is super, super light just can't do it and power ends up being somewhere in there as like a perfect happy medium between force and velocity so the moral of the story sun's out guns out no so i want you guys to read through this watch this video read the textbooks both 4460 and 4450 it's super important that you're reading the textbooks they're going to provide a lot more information than you're going to be able to get out of these youtube videos um, and really the way that i set up these classes is as you're reading through the book, the videos are going to be um, highlighting some of the some of the bigger material and, and really hoping to make sure that it creates a cleaner picture for you.